Okay, the Hangout is now live. Woo so, our speaker tonight, we're very lucky to have our speaker this evening. Um, our speaker is Dr. K. Von Stassen. Uh, he studied astronomy at Berkeley. Uh, he's got his valedictorian there and graduated in 1994. Um, he dabbled in theater as well as astronomy physics. Uh, he also was an actor and a lighting designer and eventually a stage manager for the student theater. So you can do multiple things as a physics major. You're multi-talented. Um, he did graduate work at the Univers University of Wisconsin. Uh, while he was at Wisconsin, he uh, started to develop his ideas about the importance of combining scholarly practices and research teaching and outreach uh, all together, really important things to do. Um, and uh, in addition to his thesis research, he became active in math science education for minorities in local school systems, uh, developed an outreach program called Scopes in the Schools. I mean, it's very similar to what uh, Dr. Burris does at Atkins, Arkansas, uh, which provides teachers with resources and training for teaching astronomy. So really cool. He completed his PhD in 2000. Uh, he spent a year helping to design, implement, and administer a new graduate fellowship program at Wisconsin called uh, K through Infinity Professional Development Partnership. Uh, the program partners graduate students in science and engineering fields with K through 12 teachers uh, to both enhance math science teaching in the schools and to enhance professional development of the graduate students. So. It's kind of like the grad school level of what you guys do when you do the outreach demos with schools, which is really cool. Uh, he then spent two years uh, more at Wisconsin as a Hubble Fellow before moving to Nashville at Vanderbilt University, where he is now holding the position of full professor of astronomy uh, and also an adjunct position at Fisk University. So we're very lucky to have our speaker here tonight. So please take it away. I'm going to go All ahead right. and start the videos. Uh, well, good evening. Let me just uh, greet you and uh, uh, tell you how much I wish I could share in your uh, your pizza devouring there. I'm hungry myself, watching you all too. Um, but uh, what I thought we'd do uh, today is uh, I want to share with you some of the work that my research team here at Vanderbilt has been doing with um, searching for exoplanets around other stars. Uh, but specifically by harnessing the power of the very large data sets that are now becoming available through various all-sky surveys, both on the ground and in space. Uh, and so to kick this off, uh, I have a couple of three or four minute videos there for you to, to watch. Uh, the first one was produced by the journal Nature in which last year my research team published a discovery uh, which uh, was pretty neat as you'll see in the video uh, it was a discovery that by measuring the amount by which a star's light flickers that's what we call it you can accurately measure the size of the star and its age its evolutionary state and thereby much more accurately determine the physical properties of any planets going around that star and this turns out to be a major advance in exoplanet science because for a long time, uh, I mean for the last 20 years or so, as planets have been started to be discovered around other stars, there's now a couple thousand other solar systems known. Over the past 20 years, it's been very difficult in general to determine whether a planet that we've discovered around another star is a big gaseous giant planet like, like Jupiter or Saturn or a small rocky world like Earth or Mars. And that is really one of the most important things that, that, that we want to be able to do, but it's very difficult. And now with this stellar flicker discovery, uh, that turns out to be much easier to do, so we can much more confidently discover other Earths out there. Uh, and uh, as we'll discuss after you see the video, what really enabled that discovery was, as I said, the existence of massive amounts of data for an enormous number of stars out there uh, enabled by these big surveys, massive data, big data surveys uh, going on. So think of this as the era in astrophysics that's similar to what happened in biomedical research about 15 or 20 years ago with the advent of the Human Genome Project. 
and the growth of bioinformatics. We're now entering the era of astroinformatics. Uh, and this discovery that you'll see in the video is a good example of that. So the first video was produced by the journal Nature. It's a more sort of serious video. And then for fun, uh, I, uh, I have a second video that was produced by the Science Channel, uh, which features a little bit of uh, Nashville, as you'll see. Okay. Okay, here we go. I want to share my screen, which will then let us go over and look at the... Uh, Video. All right, so we're going to do the nature one first. Sorry for the uh, cheesy Kenny G there at the end. That was <laughs> that was that was not my idea. <laughs> All right, this one's cool too. Tell us. 
go directly measure through the data that we use is small changes in brightness that a star produces due to the flickering uh, arising from the boiling and roiling motions of gas at its surface. What we can do then is take that light flickering data and transform it in a sound studio, for example, into audio frequencies. And so then we can represent with sound what we're actually detecting with light. Well, let's listen to some stars. Okay, can we hear the red giant stuff, please? Mm. Bring up the volume here. This is a very large star, very low density. And so that large amount of hiss is the result of vigorous boiling and churning at the surface of this large red giant star. Can we get the dwarf star, please? On smaller stars, sunspots dominate the sound profile, creating a low frequency drone. Actually sounds like a series of clicks. <laughs> But below the cliffs lies a faint hiss that came on meetings to size the star. Underneath it, at a very low level, is a little bit of a hiss. That little bit of hiss is actually the light flickering that we're interested in. By accurately measuring the level of this background hiss, Kavon can work out the size of the star. In this case, it's around the same size as our star, the sun. Kavon's work could be the breakthrough of an exoplanet frontier step in the It's cheap, the results are practically instantaneous, but once you know the size of the star, figuring out the size of the planets, nest and shadows, and movements, is trapped. It, it feels like a very privileged time to be a scientist, to be an astronomer uh, working in this area and contributing to the hunt for the next Earth. Here we are actually discovering these worlds by the hundreds and now on the cusp of being able to identify the next Earth. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> okay. So the um the uh, rec can you hear me? Yep. So the uh, the recording studio that we were in there for that second video uh, is the uh, historic RCA Studio A in oh. Nashville. Cool. Uh, which it turns out is now uh, owned by Ben Folds. Uh, I don't know if you all are familiar with the the band, the Ben Folds Five. They were they were around some years ago, and uh, Ben Folds is uh, is in Nashville and has uh, has um, control of this old historic recording studio. Hmm. Anyway, very Nashville kind of thing to happen. <laughs> Well, you, in Nashville, you could have had it. You could have done it at the old Ryman Theater too, right? Uh, well, I, yeah. I wish I could pull those kinds of strings. As it turned out, <laughs> that as it, is really. As, as it turned out, the only reason we ended up in the Ben Fold Studio is because the the director of our public outreach planetarium here is a uh, is a former songwriter oh. and has uh, has connections in town. Cool. So we made that one happen. So that's what you need in, in uh, Austin and in Nashville is the connections. That's right. So do we have any questions uh, from our peanut gallery here about the two videos? I got a big one. How in the heck do you go from this to size? Yeah. So that that's uh, that's really getting at the sort of the main the main point that I wanted to you know to share with you is that because the Kepler Space Telescope observes so many stars, 
Now, over such a large, long period of time and with such a high cadence, we ended up with this enormous amount of data. Basically, <sighs> Kepler, Kepler stared at uh, a little over 200,000 stars measuring their brightnesses, all, all 200,000 of them, measuring their brightnesses uh, roughly once every 30 minutes over the course of four years. So imagine taking a measurement every half hour for 200,000 stars and doing that nonstop for four years. You end up with a massive amount of data. And as it turned out, within, those, within that sample of 200,000 stars, there was a subset of about 200, um, maybe 300 stars that were bright enough so that a technique known as asteroseismology could be used in order to um, analyze in very fine detail all of the frequencies of oscillation going on in those stars. Uh, and so with asteroseismology, it's possible to measure all of the physical properties of a star ex with exquisite accuracy. The size of the star can be determined to like 1% accuracy, the mass of the star, other properties. The analogy that I like to use with astroseismology, uh, actually there's two analogies we can use. One uh, is um, you might know that in, in, uh, in, in sort of regular seismology here on the Earth, the study of earthquakes, it's possible to use the frequencies of earthquake uh, uh, pro uh, propagation through the Earth to actually determine what the density is of the Earth all the way through its interior, uh, the properties of the Earth all the way through. Uh, so, you know, w when we look at a cutaway picture of the Earth in a, in, a, in a picture book, that information largely comes to us from the analysis of seismic waves, earthquakes propagating through the Earth's interior. So similarly, on the sun and other stars, this seismology or asteroseismology can be used to probe the interiors of stars, even though we can't, for most stars, aside from the sun, even though we can't really see their surfaces, we just see them as points of light, we can use the detailed frequencies of oscillations contained in the light signals to do a similar kind of seismic analysis. Another analogy that you might use uh, that, that I like to use is imagine that you had a pot of boiling water on a stove and as the water boils and churns and roils it causes the pot as a whole to, to uh, oscillate, to, to ring in response to the churning motion of the water within. If you were to perform uh, a detailed analysis of the frequencies of vibration and oscillation of the pot as a result of the churning water, you would be able to uh, calculate things like the volume of the cavity of the pot that was doing the vibrating. Uh, you might even be able to calculate the average density of the material of the pot based on those oscillations. So in general, frequencies of vibration oscillation of any cavity allow you to calculate quite a lot about the nature of the cavity. Now, because that was able to be done for a couple hundred of the very brightest stars that Kepler observed, we were then able to relate the sizes of those stars, which had been measured seismically, to the light flickering that we could also measure for those stars. And once we had established that relationship for that benchmark set of a couple hundred stars, a relationship between the light flickering and the size of the oscillating cavity from the seismology, now we could apply that relationship to any other star in the, in the any of the other 200,000 stars in the sample. Now all we had to do was measure the light flicker and translate that into the size of the cavity of that star, um, even though those stars in, uh, are too dim to, to do the seismic analysis on directly. Hmm. So, um, so you know, really, what enabled this was the exquisite precision 
of the Kepler data, <clears throat> but as I said, also just the sheer volume of it. We never would have come across this relationship if there wasn't such a large amount of data for so many stars so that we could have enough needles in that haystack that would turn out to be this really important benchmark set of seismic stars so that then we could see the, you know, see the bigger relationship and apply that to the entire haystack. Um, what's really neat to me about this light flickering discovery is that you know, to, to go back to the analogy of the water boiling in the pot, where the seismic analysis is anal would be analyzing the frequencies of oscillation of the pot as a whole, what the light flickering technique is doing is it's really akin to observing the roiling motion of the water itself. So it turns out that the amplitude of the roiling motion of the water within the boiling pot is also related to the properties of the cavity in which it's boiling and roiling. Oh. Uh, and so, uh, in essence, what we've done is we've kind of developed a, a poor man's seismology by observing the roiling motion of the water in the pot instead of the detailed frequencies of vibration of the pot itself, which is much, much harder to do. So this is this is an easier technique that is pretty accurate. And now we can do this with any star in the sky. We can just measure its light flickering. Now we understand it's related to the roiling motions of the gas at the surface of the star. And that is in turn directly tied to the volume of the star or its size and evolutionary state. And as I said at the beginning, what really motivates all of this is a desire to understand the properties of planets orbiting those stars. So <clears throat> that's sort of a long answer to the question you just asked, but it, but it really gets at what I wanted to really get at with sharing those videos with you, is that these massive data sets for large numbers of stars really enable us to pick out needles in a haystack that actually turned out to be the keys to unlocking the, the larger mystery. Wow. Wow. Any, any other questions there about the videos? I, ha I have some other to, to talk about and share with you, but I, I wanted to make sure you had a chance to ask about, about okay. that. I have one. What was the specific reason for converting the data to sound, basically? If you had the data from the light, why put it into the sound? Basically. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, you know, it turns out that, this is something I've been interested in for a long time, it turns out that, um, you know, hu different human senses are, are, uh, are, 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 are better suited to different kinds of, basically, signal analysis. Um, <clears throat> you know, in the video, you know, at one point you saw a little trace of the light flickering data, and it just kind of looked like a squiggly line with little squiggles on top of it. As it turns out, you know, your eye, while being fantastically good at interpreting a 2 or 3D visual field, your eye is actually not particularly good at frequency analysis, basically. On the other hand, your ears are fantastically good at frequency analysis. In fact, your ears are basically analog Fourier transformers, um, you know, that dissect, you know, complex incoming signals uh, and dissect them into, you know, pretty pretty fine frequency resolution. And so, by by turning the light flickering into a from a kind of a visual pattern into an audio pattern, I mean, when you heard the sounds, you could you could hear so much more going on. You could hear the hiss. You could hear the amplitude of the hiss. You could also hear these sort of tonal variations. You could hear the click, 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 click. You could hear the wah, wah, wah. You know, there's all this stuff going on. Each one of those different aspects of the variations we can attribute to something physically going on with the stars. But in terms of just picking those signals out, it turns out that anything having to do with frequency analysis 
uh, audio is the way to go. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I would have thought that it was it was more or less just a sort of PR uh, for the video to show, okay, this is what we're doing, but you really are using sort of in that Jody Foster contact contact kind of way, you know, yeah. listen in and use your the signal processing that your ear can do to kind of pick out some more of those subtle uh, things in the data that you wouldn't see if all you did was kept the, the flicker data as ones and zeros in the computer. Right. Really, really is helpful to actually listen to it. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Any other questions before uh, we move on to the seminar itself? Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so you want me to share my screen here? Share your, uh, yeah, your presentation. All right. Uh, and as you're getting that pulled together, I'll, I'll say that, uh, as we discussed earlier, we'll have uh, Q&A kind of at the end, uh, but we've got to wrap up uh, by 6 o'clock Central Time. So if you have a question, I'll save it till the end, and we'll get through them as best as we can. All right. Okay, do you see that? Uh, go ahead and make it full, full presentation mode. There, it takes up a nice part of the screen. Good. Okay. Thanks. So as I said at the beginning, you know, this discovery of the of the stellar flicker was enabled by the massive amounts of data that we had available from the Kepler uh, space uh, telescope. This is just one example of a much larger sort of revolution that is happening in astronomy and astrophysics as a result of what pe people are calling the era of big data in astronomy or the advent of astroinformatics. And so I just wanted to share with you some uh, some, some more examples of, of, of this uh, and really just to kind of open, uh, you know, uh, 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 get you exposed to this idea because as you all progress in your careers as astronomers or physicists or, or even engineers involved in some of these big astrophysics experiments and missions, it's really the, the, the deluge of massive amounts of data that's going to be driving this, this ongoing transformation in the field. So, <clears throat> I like to sort of show this to put, put, to put things in context. So on the left, where it says traditional astronomy, is really the way that, you know, up until maybe 15 years ago or so, 10, 15 years ago, is how most astronomical research was done. Basically, an astronomer and his or her student, usually one student, went to a telescope. Uh, they stayed up all night at the telescope collecting data. Then they analyzed the data that they got, and then they wrote a paper saying, here's what we found or didn't find. And that really was the way in which astronomical research was done. It was pretty individual or, you know, very small teams using individual facilities. Now, as we enter this astroinformatics age, increasingly astronomical research is making use of multiple very large data sets from different telescopes, different observatories, different space missions, all collecting vast amounts of data that are being federated and, and, and cross-matched together. Uh, people are using services such as the NBO, which stands for the National Virtual Observatory, that brings all these massive data sets together, and people are using large computing clusters to analyze these massive amounts of data and run big simulations. So it's a very different way of doing research. In fact, it's really much more like what you see in big biomedical research these days. <clears throat> um, and so one uh, example, I want to highlight some of the neat 
results that have come out of one one such very large uh, uh, project in astronomy uh, called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey uses uh, a three and a half meter telescope in New Mexico uh, to survey a very large portion of the sky, measuring properties of millions of stars and millions of galaxies and uh, observing large numbers of supernova explosions and all kinds of stuff, and then large teams of of uh, of scientists and students, and it takes a big army of engineers to run this thing. Uh, then analyze these data products in 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 a very very large uh, collaboration in a very distributed way. But as a result, the kinds of discoveries that can be made are also very large. <coughs> So, for example, here I'm showing you a little gallery of supernova explosions discovered by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey just over a period of a couple of years. Uh, and each one of these thumbnails, you're seeing a fuzzy host galaxy within which a supernova explosion has gone off. And um, these large surveys like this have really led to a dramatic increase in the number of supernova explosions that we happen to catch and study uh, because any given galaxy will pop off a supernova explosion maybe once every hundred years or so. And so if you only stare at one galaxy, you know, you, you might get lucky and see a supernova explosion, but probably you won't. Uh, if you observe a hundred galaxies in one year, on average, you'll expect to observe one supernova. So that, that's a very slow way of building up supernova statistics. So that's why we need these very large surveys studying millions of galaxies. And now the, the odds start to be in your favor to catch lots of supernovae uh, going off at a time. And the reason that that's important, uh, this may be something that you're already familiar with, is that now that we have such a large number of supernova explosions that have been observed and their distances accurately measured, this has really been the thing that has driven the you know, truly foundational discovery of what we refer to as dark energy and the idea that the universe is not uh, recollapsing, it's not... Um, you know, it's not, you know, just in a critical stage where it'll kind of, you know, keep barely expanding forever. In fact, its, it's expansion is accelerating, as you see in this graph here. Um, you know, for a long time, the best supernova data were restricted to the, to the, uh, the data points toward the right in the graph, closer to now in time. Remember, in astronomy, when we look out and farther out in space, we're looking farther back in time. And so the supernovae that have been discovered in large number through these large surveys have really begun to give us statistics on these more distant, farther back in time supernovae that you see were really critical to distinguishing between the green and blue and yellow curves. For a long time, you know, the green and blue and yellow curves were all pretty equally well fit by the available data toward the right. We needed the measurements toward the left to really be able to see that it's the yellow line that's the right model and rule out the green and blue. So the, so the fundamental discovery of dark energy and the accelerating expansion of the universe um, uh, really owes a lot to these large surveys discovering large numbers of supernovae. So that's a very tangible example that you uh, maybe ha have some familiarity with uh, in, from, in terms of recent big discoveries that are the result of these massive surveys and big data sets. <clears throat> Another, to me, very interesting, uh, really new kind of way of looking at the universe is a picture like this one. What you're seeing here are measurements of the positions and color-coded the motions of millions of stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. 
And what you see is that the colors of stars in certain places have a, a, a coherence to them, and they're labeled. So, for example, down toward the bottom, you see what's called the Sag Sagittarius stream. And then a little bit to the right, kind of extending more vertically, you see what's called the Orphan stream. There are other structures in here. And it turns out that what these structures represent are literally rivers of stars flowing coherently through the larger ocean, if you will, of the Milky Way. You know, kind of like uh, you probably know there are there are coherent currents or streams within the Atlantic Ocean, you know, the Gulf Stream and other motions, sort of like a, a river of water moving through the larger body of water. Just like that, the Milky Way has within it coherent streams and currents of stars moving coherently. And the reason for that, we now understand, is that the Milky Way in the past was assembled in part through the uh, cannibalization, if you will, of smaller satellite galaxies that originally orbited it. And as the Milky Way ingested those smaller galaxies, uh, the stars that made up those smaller galaxies can still be seen moving coherently through the larger Milky Way. And so we now understand something really fundamental about the origin of galaxies like the Milky Way, uh, their history of ingesting other galaxies, and we can, we can see that today imprinted in the motions of these relic stars. So it's a kind of archaeo-astronomy uh, in the, uh, or, 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 uh, kind of galactic archaeology, maybe is a better way of saying it. Uh, in our in our Milky Way, <clears throat> and it takes measurements of millions and millions of stars, their positions, their colors, and their motions to be able to come to this kind of discovery. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, this is something that maybe you've seen before, but it's really foundationally important. What you're seeing here is a map, a 3D map, uh, or not a 3D map, but you're seeing a you're seeing a map of the positions of galaxies um, uh, uh, in terms of distance away from the Earth. So Earth is at the center of that picture. <clears throat> and the two sort of pie wedges up and down are the directions that the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was observing. The black areas to the right and left are just the, the directions that the telescope didn't look. And the color coding uh, represents the number of galaxies at that spot, uh, with red representing lots of galaxies and black representing no galaxies. And so what you see immediately is that galaxies distributed across the universe are not distributed uniformly. It's not like taking a handful of sand and throwing it uh, out uh, throwing it outward and then the sand grains just kind of flinging themselves uniformly in all directions. There's much more structure to this than you would expect from a, from a uniform uh, distribution. Uh, in fact, this, might, this, this kind of picture might remind you of images of neurons in the brain or, uh, or, or a structure like a sponge where you have where you have big, empty crannies or voids uh, that, are that are delineated by sort of thin membranes. Uh, the, the universe as a whole, at least in terms of the distribution of matter, is much more like a sponge or a, or a membrane like that, uh, where you have relatively thin, well-defined, dense regions surrounding and delineating vast, large, voids, empty regions. Um, this is a really, you know, ma massively important change in the way that we now view the universe as a whole compared to how it was conceived of uh, some decades ago. The universe as a whole really has structure. 
Uh, and ultimately, this tells us, by analyzing the structure in detail, we can learn about the nature of dark matter um, uh, and of dark energy uh, in the early universe and, and now. <clears throat> now, these examples of really groundbreaking discoveries and changes in the way that we see our galaxy and the universe as a whole uh, are really just the tip of the iceberg. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey that I was just telling you about was actually a relatively small experiment compared to what astronomers are planning in the coming decade. Uh, so probably the, 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 the biggest planned uh, uh, facility for this is something called LSST, which stands for Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. This will be a 10-meter telescope that will be built in the Chilean Andes. And <clears throat> the LSST will, in essence, make continuous movies of the entire sky. It will observe um, uh, over a billion, maybe 10 billion stars um, and, and repeatedly, uh, it'll measure those stars in multiple, uh, uh, at multiple wavelengths. Uh, it'll observe millions and millions and millions of galaxies and quasars. Um, and the entire data set that LSST will generate is really kind of mind-boggling. Uh, LSST is, is expected to produce about 30 terabytes of data every day. And to, and to do so for about 10 years. <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's twice the Library of Congress every single day. I mean, it's a massive amount of information. And so, uh, you know, with, with the, this increasing volume of data comes an increasing opportunity to make rare but foundationally important discoveries. But one of the things I wanted to really mention, especially to those of you who might be more kind of, um, in, you know, uh, of the engineering uh, uh, disposition as opposed to sort of, um, you know, data or, or, or pure science, there's really a need for, for advances in engineering and technology to, to, to do this kind of work. What you're seeing here is a representation of the camera that is being built for the LSST telescope. On the left, you can see the, the sort of the mock-up of the overall optical design for the camera. And it's the size of a small car. Um, and um, so it'll be the largest camera ever built. Uh, and so, you know, that presents challenges in engineering and optical design and you know, mechanical control. And then on the far right, what you're seeing is um, an example of the typical uh, uh, digital detector that is used in most astronomical cameras. It's uh, that one that you're seeing being held in the picture is considerably larger than the digital, digital detector that you have in your in your cell phone, for example. Um, but even that relatively large astronomical purpose digital detector is nothing in comparison to the digital detector that will be built for the LSST. In the middle, you're seeing a student holding a mock-up of the LSST digital detector. <laughs> wow. An enormous array and I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, but that thing that she's holding has like a little grid pattern. So each one of those, each one of those sort of grid cells is one of the digital detectors that you see on the right. Wow. So it's it's a it's a it's you know it's a big challenge from an from an electrical engineering uh, and computer science standpoint to you know to electronically control these uh, sensitive devices in tandem. Uh, the LSST needs to be able to take a snapshot with that enormous digital detector sitting at the back of that car-sized camera uh, roughly once every 30 seconds or so. So you have to read out 
the information, you know, you have to steer this 10 meter telescope and the car size camera behind it and you know, do a click of the shutter and 30 seconds later you have to read, electrically read out that enormous array of digital detectors generating 30 terabytes of data over the course of the night. Anyway, you know, you, you, you're getting the idea. It's, <clears throat> it's a big, big challenge. It's going to be a big, uh, a really a big accomplishment uh, easily as much on the engineering side as on the science side. Um, let me see here. Uh, so, one of the really neat things that can be done with make is that you get movies of the sky. <laughs> uh, here's, here's an example of an actual movie of uh, approximately 20 stars that orbit about the supermassive black hole that's at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So the location of the supermassive black hole is indicated by that five-pointed star there. Uh, this movie is going to loop again. And those little colored rainbow blobs are individual stars that are actually uh, uh, orbiting around the very center of our galaxy around that supermassive black hole. And uh, you can see at the upper left, time ticking by, these data span uh, a little over 10 years, maybe uh, oh, about 15 years. And <clears throat> you can see that some of those stars, there goes one whipping around on a beautifully elliptical orbit. So Kepler was right. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but by the, by measuring the speeds of those orbits and their sizes and how incredibly close to the black hole some of those come, we can directly weigh the black hole, we can measure how massive it is, and put really, really tight constraints on how big it can be. So, fr so from a movie like this, we now know that the black hole at the center of the Milky Way weighs about four million suns, um, and it must be extremely compact. The, that one star there that whizzes by really, really close, that one, um, comes closer to the black hole than the size of our solar system. Hmm. So, um, you know, anyway, it's, it's pretty definitive proof, you know, to, that, that there's a supermassive black hole in our galaxy to have something that weighs four million suns but is smaller than the solar system, there's really not a whole lot that it could be other than a really heavy black hole. Anyway, so, you know, doing these movies of the sky, and this is looking at, you know, the, the, the extent of this movie, as you see from the scale bar on the left-hand side, the extent of the, of the frames in this movie is only about one arc second in, in, in size. So now imagine being able to have movies like this of the entire sky. It's just it's mind blowing. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's see. I'm gonna skip a couple of these things just in the interest of time. But let me let me mention this one. This is one of my favorite kinds of things that we'll be able to do with the massive LSST data. Something called micro lensing. So you might you might know that gravity can bend light. And so there's a phenomenon uh, uh, referred to as microlensing. And you're seeing an example of an actual microlensing event in the graph there. Microlensing refers to, um, imagine that you're looking at a distant star. And just by chance, another star drifts by uh, between us and that more distant star. Well, you might think that as the, as the one star passes between us and the more distant star, you might think that it would block out, that the, that the intervening star would block the light from the more distant star because it gets in the way. Um, in fact, what happens is that if the alignment is just right, the light from the more distant star gets gravitationally bent around 
the intervening star. And so the light from the more distant star actually becomes magnified. The intervening star basically acts like a gravitational lens that focuses even more of the distant star's light than what we saw before. Um, and now imagine that that intervening star, that is the lens, the gravitational lens, has a little planet going around it. So it's almost like the lens has a speck on it <laughs> from a gravitational standpoint. So now, in addition to the light from the more distant star being magnified by the lens, it also has a little blemish because the lens has a speck on it. And that's what you're seeing in this, uh, in this graph. What you see is the light over the core on the x-axis. You see time and days spanning about 90 days <clears throat> in total. And in the middle, starting at around day 45 or so, you see the light starts to get brighter and brighter and brighter. And then it goes, shoom, and it climbs way up magnifies by a factor of 50 or so. And then you can, see a, you can see a zoom in on the right around day 50, and you can see that there's a little double horn spike at the top of that dramatic spike. <clears throat> and basically the reason for, the, for all of this detail, and you see the black curve matches all of the data points exactly. That black curve is a model representing a lens with a with a speck <laughs> and so we can determine from an event like this everything about the lens basically the more distant star is basically just acting like a light bulb but what, we, what you really learn about is the lens you learn about the size of the lens because the you know it's 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 operating gravitationally so you learn about the size of the lens, and you also learn about any specks around the lens. Um, and so this has now been done with ground-based telescopes uh, for um, about 15 years now, and, there, and it's been done successfully uh, a few dozen times. With the LSST, we'll be able to do this thousands and thousands and thousands of times over. So this will really revolutionize our understanding of solar systems in the Milky Way galaxy. <clears throat> um, and so just to close here and then we can take some questions in addition to this revolution in big data for astronomy you know really um, revolutionizing our understanding of the universe uh, and in addition to it requiring a revolution in engineering and optical design all that stuff I told you about before it's also driving a revolution in big computing. <clears throat> Here you're seeing my Vanderbilt colleague, Kelly Holly Bockelman, standing next to the supercomputing facility at Vanderbilt. Um, you know, where basically you've got 1,500 multi-gigahertz processors with many gigabytes of me memory apiece, all electronically strung together. Uh, in order to be able to do petabyte scale, terabyte per second um, calculations. And the kind of thing that you can do with that kind of computing power is um, you can do really impressive simulations. So let me skip this one and show you the next one here. Let's see. I think the screen share is slowing me down. Okay, here we go. What you're seeing here are simulated universes. <laughs> and it takes a lot of computing time to simulate a universe. It takes, in this case, it took my Vanderbilt colleague, Andreas Berlin, six million CPU hours on one of the most powerful supercomputers out there called the TerraGrid to do these simulations. But you remember that map that I showed you of the distribution of galaxies in the universe and their sort of neuron brain-like structure. What 
what my colleague Professor Berlin does is in the computers he simulates lots of different universes and, uh, it, it, within which he tweaks the, the distribution of ordinary matter and dark matter and dark energy and the, you know, and the physics involved in the expansion of the universe over time. And so each one of these simulated universes is sort of like you know, getting to play God over and over and over again and seeing what happens when you create a slightly different universe under slightly different conditions every time. And so what you can then do with these simulated universes is you can compare them statistically with, an, with a real map of the universe like the one that I showed you before and then and now we'll have an even more detailed one with LSST and basically use that kind of comparison of the one real universe you know, the, the, the real experiment only got to happen once unfortunately <laughs> uh, but these simulated ones we can do over and over and over again and basically we can use this kind of comparison to discern what is the real physical ingredients for the one universe that we have? So um, I think I'll stop there. Uh, I can spend maybe five more minutes with you here before I have to go. Um, but I'm happy to take take your questions. Nick, you got a question? Uh, what's the time scale for the LST LSST player? Yeah. So. Uh, so construction was just approved by the National Science Board this past year, uh, and so it's expected to see first light around 2019 or 2020. Okay. John, I'm really curious, uh, as you know, um, you said it took, what, 6.2 million CPU hours to process that? Is it just an image that it processed? Is it just what now? For your simulation, did it process just an image for the 6.2 million uh, hours? Oh, no, no. The, the image that you're seeing is just a representation of the data that are coming out of the simulation. What the simulation does is it puts in a whole bunch of, uh, you know, um, simulated galaxies into a large volume and then puts in the physics of gravity, um, uh, uh, interactions between ordinary matter and dark matter. Um, uh, you can have physics of uh, accelerating expansion due to dark energy. And <coughs> excuse me. And then each one of those simulations runs forward in time, and the galaxies move and they interact and they clump and they spread. And at the end of that of one of those simulations, you can see where the galaxies have ended up. And then you can make an image of that to represent it. Um, but what? But the thing that really takes all of that computing time is to track all of those individual galaxies as they're interacting and behaving under gravity and whatever all else over time. What kind of language did you guys use for that? Uh, well, so you know, uh, the, the, those simulations that I showed you was not my own work, so. Um, oh, yeah. But but I uh, but I'm pretty sure most of that stuff is done in um, in C. Any other questions from the audience? Arnold, Arnold, you got any? Alex, no, no. So Alex, a uh, student in the back, he does some uh, exoplanet sort of look astronomy type projects with one of our uh, observational astronomers here. Um, you want to mention a little bit about what you do? Well, I, uh, I'm at RDU at Leon, and I work with Joshua Pepper. So oh, great. Yeah. So I got to work with Kel. So I know some, I mean, some experience with all the data. You know, to work with. I've a lot of it. Well, speaking about REUs, uh, does your lab have any REU uh, opportunities that are coming up? Yes. Can apply for. Tell us about some of the REU opportunities that may be available. Sure. So the um, let, let, let me just pull up the uh, the website on my browser here so that I can get the deadline right. Um, 
-hmm. Yeah, so, so the Vanderbilt Physics and Astronomy Department has an REU program. We have an early application deadline of February 15th, uh, which is good if, you know, if you really feel like Vanderbilt is really where you want to come. Um, you know, we, we always make some number of early offers based on people who apply by the early deadline. But we also have a final deadline of March 15th. Um, and we always reserve some number of slots for people who apply it later. <clears throat> anyway, um, if you apply by either February 15th or March 15th, uh, we, uh, we definitely have a number of opportunities. Um, my own lab, uh, you know, as you've now seen, um, focuses on exoplanets and stellar astrophysics. Um, but the REU program as a whole is a physics and astronomy REU program, so we also have you know, biophysics and nanophysics and um, all kinds of stuff. So if you Google Vanderbilt Physics REU, it, 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 should, it should come right up for you. Cool. John, I was looking at an array you had for the, um, the sensor for the camera, the LSST. And I noticed the array, and I was really curious as to whether um, you guys take the continuous footage, if it is snapshotted all at once, or if it goes by each individual array really quickly. Oh, no, it's, it's all at once. So basically, each, you know, each of those, it's sort of like tying together, uh, you know, a million, self, uh, a million uh, smartphones and having the, and having and having them each point at a slightly different spot and then each time you you say you know click they all expose simultaneously and then you read them all out simultaneously and then you piece them together to make your one big picture wow that's tough i'm just trying to make sense of how much ram that would take <laughs> <laughs> Well, we always ask this, or I always ask this last question. Uh, what sort of advice would you give um, undergraduates in a physics, astronomy, or engineering type uh, degree track? Uh, what sort of advice would you give students that are now undergrads looking forward as uh, you can from your perspective? What, what, what sort of advice would you give students now? My number one piece of advice by far is to get involved in research. By far, by far. I'll tell you, uh, and I say that for a couple of reasons. One is that if, if your entire experience as a physics major is taking physics courses, um, I mean, of course you have to do that, uh, but if that's your entire experience, then in essence you're limiting yourself as a scientist to only learning about science and never getting to actually do science. Amen. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's a fundamental thing to keep in mind. It's easy to forget that when, of course, you know, you're worried about getting good grades and, you know, in the day-to-day -day you have problem sets to turn in and all that stuff. And, you know, you have to do that and, you know, obviously do, you know, get good grades. But, um, you know, being a scientist at the end of the day means actually doing science and not just learning about it. <laughs> And you know, and, and and I think that's really the way also to kind of you know keep your keep your fire for it lit. Um, uh, at at a more practical level, I'll tell you, you know, any more when we evaluate applications to our PhD program, you know, to to be competitive, you you really have to have had some research experience. Um, you know, you can have straight A's in your physics courses, and if you haven't done any research at all, you're really at a big, big disadvantage. Um, because when students come into our graduate program, or any graduate program, you know, the thing that you have to very quickly realize is that, okay, maybe in your first year of graduate school, you'll be, you know, it'll feel more or less like a continuation of undergrad in the sense that you'll, you know, you'll be taking a bunch of classes and stuff. But after about your first year of grad school, the game changes completely. And it's just not at all anymore about the classes you're taking or the grades that you get. It becomes entirely about you apprenticing as a 
as a young scientist and everything that you will be evaluated on after that point will have nothing to do with your grades and be entirely about your skill and dedication and performance in the lab. So for all of those reasons, getting research experience now is by far, you know, just by a country mile, <laughs> the most important thing you can do for yourself. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. Do we have any more questions? No? Well, we definitely stress the uh, undergraduate research here at UCA and encourage our students to also apply for external REUs so they get to see what, what it's like at a real R1 institution. Uh, we're just a primarily undergraduate institution here, but we give our students good preparation. So hopefully we'll have a few applicants to Vanderbilt soon. Great. <laughs> well, let's thank our speaker. This has been a fantastic seminar. I really appreciate your time. I know you've got to run, so uh, thank you again. And uh, I will share a video link with you whenever uh, tomorrow rolls around. Okay. Thank you all, and good luck. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. <laughs>